Hello, everybody, and welcome to Authored Content. This is episode 23. Uh, we have our regular crew today. Uh, Doug Winnie from the left here. Ray, uh, Ray Williamson, James Williamson, who's very angry about a flex box right now. <laughs> uh, Ray Vigilobos. Hey there. And Simon Ray, Ray, Allardyce. Ray, Ray. Fresh Hello. back Simon. from the Apple event thing. That Indeed. Happened. Back from the, the womb of the, of the mothership. The, the select few. <laughs> the select 5,000. Yeah, did, how, how fast did it run out of, did they run out of spots? Seven, 71 seconds, 5,000 tickets, $1,600 so a what, pop. What, how the heck did you get in? Like, what did you yeah. do? Did you have 5,000 people, like, pretending to be you, you know? I you guess hired, like, a whole team of, like, uh, Malaysian people, you know? You know, I think what it is, it's just all the, all the years of playing first-person shoot 'em ups play them off. You know, you have the trigger finger that's just... <laughs> Okay, I'm I'm in there. I'm in there. <laughs> they, they, they did it. They did it in alphabetical order, which is why Jeffrey Selden can never get the <laughs> I do not know. No, I was one of the lucky few that just, you know, I was sitting there all ready to go. I had my CC number copied, ready to paste. I had all this stuff um, set up. So yeah, I was uh, I was invested in getting a ticket, and I was one of the lucky few who didn't get an error after they put something in their shopping cart. So mm. yeah, I just I consider myself lucky I got in. I was so how and, many uh, how many pushes did it take? This was like one push and you were in or yeah, for me actually the process was pretty pretty easy. Um, huh. as soon as they opened up I, I got in. It's just for other people who seem to get locked down. Uh, so Yeah that's like a whole minute and ten ten or so seconds. Uh, so you're so amazing. basically you basically you have to be like a super like rock star at eBay in order to <laughs> get a ticket to the BDC. <laughs> Well, yeah, bro. The, the thing was, I think as I'd mentioned the last time I was on, before they actually announced the fact that they, uh, they were going to open up at a particular time, um, they, in the past they've just kind of gone by surprise. They've just, the tickets have just appeared. Hmm. So I'd had all these little scripts running every 10 seconds to check the WWDC site that were going to SMS me, that were going to turn on the lights in my house if it happened at 5 o'clock in the morning to actually wake me up. All of that was ready to go, tested, and for the test-driven development process. And, um, and I didn't need any of it because they then said, oh, we're opening up at 9 o'clock tomorrow. So, okay. But <laughs> I, I will admit, I am not going to go through that fuss again. I, I really wanted to go this time, but um, unless they do a lottery or whatever, I'm not going to try and get into 20 seconds next year. So mm -hmm. I don't know what they're going to do next time. Yeah, this I, is actually I becoming a common problem with events in general. Um, we, I, I run a very small event in Vancouver, and uh, we only have 60 tickets. And wow. the first year, it took a couple of days to sell out. And now it literally goes in 10 seconds. It's the, it goes up and it's like, gone. Right. All tickets are gone. And it's just ridiculous because everyone goes, oh, I heard about this cool event. I want to go check out tickets. They're gone. So you only get the people who are super invested, who are on the website at the time when you release the tickets. And everything else just goes. Pick. Conferences are not a thing that scales. They really don't. That's a, it's a, yeah, it doesn't scale to success very well. And even when you get to the, the level of things like, say, a SIGGRAPH or whatever, which might be 25, 30,000 people, or a Comic-Con, it's just, yeah, it's just a nightmare. I'd hate to be involved in that kind of sales stuff. <laughs> you know, I have a theory that they had, like, a Simon Allardyce, like, filter. And the reason <laughs> you got so fast you know, through the process was, oh, it's Simon. Let him in this time. I would love to believe that to be true. <laughs> um, I no, I doubt it. So, what's your takeaway from um, Apple's uh, plan for future world domination? Well, you know, th th I don't think anybody was surprised by what happened at you know what got announced at the keynote. You know, there's a few there was a few rumors about will we see a TV, will we see a watch, and none of that happened. We had iOS, we had a new version of uh, OS X. I mean, WWDC is a, a kind of a surprisingly different conference from the other developer conferences I go to in that this isn't open. They don't do a call for participation. They don't open it up to speakers. It's just mm -hmm. really go to spend a week with the Apple engineers. That's the whole reason behind this conference and why it exists. So it has a very, a very different vibe from a lot of, quote, regular, close quote, conferences. Um, so no particular surprises. Everybody saw iOS 7. The rumors had been flying around that this was going to have a flat design, and it certainly 
flatter. I wouldn't call it flat. I mean, the, you know, people kind of came around, oh, it's, oh it's, it's just like Windows Phone. It's like, really? Are you blind? Can you look at this and say this is like Windows Phone? It looks nothing like Windows. It doesn't feel like Windows Phone. There's nothing like it. But um, yeah, so iOS 7 announced, uh, Mavericks announced the Mac Pro, which it's, you know, it's now getting to the point of I look at the Mac Pro and think, I don't so need it one. Looks kind of like this. One. It does, indeed, absolutely. There are there are trash cans that have a actually, distinct did you, resemblance. Did you actually get to see one live, yes. like touch it, touch the yeah. I, you well, know, iOS seven? They had they had a few there on on stands that you could actually mm -hmm. see. You know, the the not quite mock-ups, but the pre-production versions of them. So they had a few completed. They had a few with the open to the components, but it was really there for you to go, ooh ah. Um, they weren't connected to screens. It was just, you know, uh, it was nice Absolutely, to see yeah. them. And they look, they look lovely. They look great. But uh, do I actually have a reason for one? Not really. You know, my MacBook Retina is kind of fast for anything I need to throw at it. But you never know. You never know. But now they come in different colors, too. I saw yesterday they were saying they come in, like, a spaceship blue and a... Oh, I didn't see that. Didn't lipstick know. red and a... <laughs> Sure, it's going to be a pink one, too. I'd go for basic black. What are we seeing on Doug's? I don't know. What are you showing us, Doug? What is that? Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, Kool-Aid. Kool Mr. Kool-Aid. <laughs> the Kool-Aid website. Is there See, a so I, Is that a I flash to... site? Is that flash? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't think so. <laughs> I hope it is. Yes, it is. Ah. Yes. Wow. Nice. Yes. Yes. So it's, they do you still put it on your phone. Will work on your iPad. Oh so, yeah! Since we have a couple of uh, designer people here, um, uh, of course we haven't seen the final version of any of this iOS stuff. But there are some clear design decisions that have been made here. Uh, what what do we think? Can, can, can I can I, I just want to interrupt though? I, I want to talk more about that Mac Pro for a second. Because, yes. So why spend all that research in industrial engineering and all this stuff? Onto a dying form factor. Well, it's, it's see, not dying. It is not a dying form factor. It's a dying form factor in people's houses, but it's not a dying form factor when people are doing like, if you <clears throat> go into a production facility, you need super powerful computers that are really cool, cold inside, and that can actually extend extend and be enabled in different ways. And these laptops, they just don't do the job. I mean, if I gave my wife a laptop. She would kill it in six months. <laughs> the stuff, the kind of work she does, it would just fry it. Like she's frying processors from uh, servers. Like she, her current co computer runs a server processor and is dead. It just sure. she fried it. But, she but how, but how the hell do you upgrade the new Mac Pro? I mean, how do you put in? There's the thing. It's it's going to be that's the model. So a lot of people kind of complain. So the old Mac Pro was great for expandability. I had a yeah. whole bunch of it's open space you could shove new things in. And this no, 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 no. It was great for expandability in theory, but there were so few actual video cards that worked with it that, right. you know, it was a lie. But mm -hmm. if you wanted disk drives, if you wanted that kind of stuff, at least you could, you know, you had space for it. This right. one's going to be, it's going to be all Thunderbolt. It's going to be, you expand this by adding extra new pieces of kit, um, you know, I, I think. And again, I go back, I agree entirely with Morton. Do I need one? No. But my brother, for example, see, he's a 3D graphics guy. He already has, you know, his office at home has multiple machines in it with a separate AC unit because those things just wow. have <laughs> radiators that go up all the time because he's rendering all the time and putting it off into multiple machines. But he'd be all over this thing like, a, like yeah, immediately. Yeah, you know, video editing, of course, we all, you know, all our, you know, video gets edited in, in pro machines. So I can imagine those people just can't have enough power. And so anything that has even more power, you know, will be uh, beneficial to them. Yeah, but I, I I wonder it's like when you build a tower like that, the first thing I want to do is stuff a couple extra hard drives in, and I'm like, there's no hard drives in there. No. I have to have external hard drives. The reason why I don't want external hard drives is because I want them to be inside the unit so I can control them better. When they're external and you have cables, you know, my guinea pig will come and eat the cable, and someone will trip over it, and the something will fall off the table, and it takes up extra room. So you're not really solving anything. I just found it really I mean, funny that they kept saying I mean, Thunderbolt's meant to be like a temporary <clears throat> connection. It's not meant to be like yeah. hardwired thing. So if you ever set up like a raid with multiple Thunderbolt drives, and then you know, it's, <laughs> how's that going to work? You know. Well. <clears throat> What I was thinking of was they kept saying this is new design. Like 
we can't design anymore. So I was like, the first thing I thought of when I saw it was <laughs> this. So this is That's the... That's nice. Do you remember the, remember the G4, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Everyone bought, and then they realized that thing overheated like uh, sauna. Yeah. And then and it right. cracked. And then, so yeah, I was like, Kurta. so you have the Kurta, which is this ancient uh, calculation device that you literally crank it. So you set the numbers and you crank it and it'll do a calculation. And I'm like, they are really harking back to old design here with this. Uh, they've taken the concept of the G4, combined it with the Kurta, and then made a new computer. That's what they call classic, Morton. Yes. A classic. That's what I call, that's what I call not innovation. <laughs> you know what? Um, but, but, they, is... but they said that they are still innovating. Come on. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean but now, now, iOS, now, you know, now iOS icons aren't perfectly rounded rectangles. I mean, come on. What kind of, that's, that's innovation right there. Uh, but here's the thing. All you guys would say exactly the same thing no matter what they came up with. It's not like they're going to invent a color that is a floating, super intelligent shade of the color blue. They still have to work with this idea of some kind of physical device. If it was square, if it was round, if it was rectangular, some kind of oblong or octahedron, everyone would go, oh, that's not innovation. I could yeah, have but, done that. But this is, this is designed for the sake of design. This is not designed for the sake of actual usability. That, well, that to me, now, garbage that? thing. That's the, the case. Didn't you see that? There was a guy that said, the first thing will happen if I put that computer on my desk is that someone will like put their cigarette in it because it looks like something you put things in. And I can see every kid, that like if that's in a house of any small child, the small child will dump things into it. And it's a fan, so it'll be like, and then <laughs> crap will fly out. It'll be really funny, but you know, Morton. it's a great way of destroying things. Hey, Morton. Yeah. Um, you know, you've you've uh, have you ever seen any of the side by side comparison to the Apple products and the Braun products that they I they have were inspired by? Yeah. I mean, hang on, I've got um, one up here. Let me let me show you. So it, Apple being quote unquote inspired by somebody else is nothing new. Um, it's happened years, and they've, they've pulled so much. Oops, let me go over so I can actually do this thing. Um, they've pulled so much from companies like Braun, uh, but the fact that they're bringing them into you know the personal computing market, uh, I mean, look at that. Wow. Um, <laughs> what's the first one? Yeah, what's the thing on the left? <laughs> that is the thermostat. Raider no, 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 the, the camera. The last one you had. Oh, the last one, yeah. It's a um, it's a camera versus the uh, one of the Apple webcams, one of the original webcams. So it is a camera, the first one. Mm. It is, yeah. Huh. Well, yeah, and, and it's true what you're saying. Nothing wrong with um, <laughs> nothing new under the sun. In, in design, it's just that when you design something, like the whole reason why people bought the Mac Towers is because, like you said, they're extendable. They're real proper computers that you can jam stuff into. You can put like 18 graphics cards in it. You can jam it full of hard drives, right? And then they say, okay, so we're going to serve that market, the ones that want that kind of functionality by giving them a tube that you can't put anything into. So now it's like, now you've redesigned something that people didn't need to have redesigned yeah, just for the know, hell I, of it. I no, think, I think it remained to be seen about the fact, I, you know, the idea that people at Apple are like, oh, we never thought about that fact. I think there's quite a lot that is still to be released. I mean, I'd be very <laughs> interested to see what they've considered in, does this thing get expandable? It kind of ends up looking like little kind of pepper pots on top of each other. Is it built to do that? Uh, you know, I give them cool. a little bit more credit than than the idea of oh, they didn't understand that anybody ever added a hard drive to a machine. Yeah, I think I think Apple is making a statement here, much like they've done in the past. You know, I mean, you know, did Apple need to continue putting floppies and uh, you know other things in machines? No, they're making a statement that says you know we believe that the future of the a pro device that's a high performing device expands on the outside, not on the inside. That's just essentially what they're saying. Expandability from now on, the, the cables uh, that exist right now are fast enough to handle anything anybody could possibly want. So we believe expandability will come you know, externally, and um, this machine has what it takes. And, and I think they, they, that's a bold statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Right now, people think we need to be able to put things in the machine, and Apple's kind of changing that thinking, and that's one thing that they do a lot. They they well, change the way people you know utilize you know machines, and I think that's you know, that's what they usually do. So well, you surprised. you worked with photo and video, so you know this. 
the reason why you have multiple multiple hard drives in your computer is because when you work with that kind of stuff, especially when you do scrubbing video, you kill hard drives. They just die. They can't handle it, and they just conk out. And this thing has like an SSD drive, and they die even worse than regular hard drives because once they're conked out, you can't re recuperate anything, right? So it just design-wise, this is not a, not a good idea. I mean, people well, I know it just do depends. video you're thinking You're thinking about how you know things used to work in the past. Like no. that's the way things have worked up to now. But let's say that you had SSD that was big enough and reliable enough. Assume that it's going to get better. Then what they're saying is this is the future. If you can not think about the fact that SSD is maybe right now a little unreliable, not yeah, but big enough. They're selling enough. them right now. <laughs> no, they're not selling them yet. They're selling them later <laughs> on this year. Yeah. But whatever, whatever it is, they're just saying this is the future of a pro device. That's that, that that's, that's the statement they're making. And I think they're probably right. Like, think about it. Like, you know, do we still need to have like a jazz drive, external jazz? No, we don't really need that anymore. You know, uh, at some point, USBs took that market over. And bear and in so, mind, technically speaking, you know, this is a new, this is new technology. This is not your classic SSD. It's the what? It's the PCIe flash mm -hmm. stuff. It's not. You know, it's not just okay. We're pulling an off-the-shelf SSD drive and shutting it, shoving it into a hot case. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think I think that's what Apple does best. You know, they sort of do a good job of helping everybody get pushed away from things that maybe don't need to be there anymore. I, I you know, I think it's a bold move. And I and I completely agree with the idea that you know, have Apple regularly done stuff that they put out there and it just doesn't hit things like the Cube? Sure, absolutely. But I also remember things like. You know, when the Air got announced, the general feedback and all the tech press going, this is ridiculous. Who's going to buy a laptop without a disk drive in? Who's exactly. going to buy one no. of these? This or is a CD stupid. drive, right? Uh, this Who's going to buy anything without a CD drive? Exactly. This is going to fall over dead. No one's going to care. It's like, mm, how'd that work out? <laughs> exactly. So the push, I think the rest of the market, you're going to see more, you know, Pro tubes. machines that maybe use SSDs. No, no, tubes. I mean, the tube thing, I think they sort of like most, run most... out of shape sometimes. Like, they're like, oh, okay, you know, we did a cube. Uh, we sort of did like a half circle, like a half grapefruit. What else can we do? And the, well, the most, cylinder most of these, hasn't been uh, done before. <laughs> you know. Most of these uh, towers that are sold now have, have either hybrid drives or SSDs in them. So it's not like that's new. I'm, I'm more concerned about the expandability part because I can see video production facilities refusing to buy this because they can't use video it. Video production facilities, I think, are going to flock to this thing, and it's going to run out. Yep. Hard to get. I, and I then they're going to start you. complaining that it's not they're expandable. Gonna, they're, well, they're always you know, going to complain, but already <laughs> video places go for, you know, external bunch of, of, of drives, external uh, RAID systems, all that kind of stuff. That, they already do that. But don't you think that they actually are running a risk? I mean, if if they do push this, I mean, more and more people are moving away from Final Cut Pro and going into yeah. uh, Premiere. Premiere. That you know, that like, look, if we want all the expandability that we want, we'll just get a cheap PC tower, run with Premiere, have After Effects, and and you know, work with uh, Pro Tools. I mean, yeah, and, and that's, that's true, because when I worked um, in 2005, when I worked in a TV station, they were buying all Mac towers, because that was like, if you don't do FCP, you're basically not going to have a job in this business. And now, a lot of the people I know who do only FCP are actually getting laid off because they don't know how to use Premiere, because everyone's moving to Premiere. And yeah, I remember you know, if back you go then, by that, remember like PageMaker. Let's think of well, like yeah. all the technologies that used to be the only way to do things, and the, and have modified to be something else. I'm certified. Yeah, but the difference though is that Final Cut Pro is Mac only. Yeah. that's the difference. Sure. Yeah, but I think you know all all Apple has to do is come out with a new version of Final Cut that kicks ass, and everybody will switch back to it. Frankly, I mean, yeah, all, I, all, I can't all really they have to do. Right. No, yeah, I mean, they don't, they don't seem to be very believe, interested in doing that, right? Recording well, on here? You know, I can't believe that Final Cut became an industry standard in the first place. Like, you know, um, nothing for a while existed for Apple to be a serious editing machine until a few years ago. So they could do it again. I mean, I, you know, I think at some point, again, they made a decision of what they wanted to be doing with editing, and they completely changed the workflow. That pissed a lot of people off. But... You know, I think all they need to do is come out with something else, which I think is kind of part of their plan. I mean, I, you know, Absolutely. that was a tough decision to make, and I think they're going to make another piece of software that, and they're probably working on it already. That's going to probably turn it around again. It's Absolutely, and I think there's there's some similarity. I think to to if you look at what happens kind of in the professional audio world as well, where if you're a company 
who decided just to target the pros. You can sell well, you can sell at a high expense, but it's the folks who are doing the, the more accessible programs like mm -hmm. the Ableton and Fruity Loops and all that kind of stuff grows because it's not professional. Same way a lot of people complained about Final Cut Pro X. Oh, this, isn't, this doesn't have the grading kind of techniques they did. It's almost like a, like a, prof you know, a pro version of iMovie. And I remember hearing that and thinking, well, that sounds great. <laughs> I'm going to buy it. That's, that's exactly what I want. I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a prosumer with delusions of grandeur. I like messing around with video a little more than you know, my dad might like messing around with video, so I want a bit more that iMovie gives me. And that audience is a hell of a lot bigger than just video pros, so they're, they're kind of semi-pro prosumer market. And if they're making the decision to go there, well, this is a fantastic machine. I don't and need did full rate. Did any of you guys of like stuff. edit in Final Cut? Like Final Cut editing to me had been broken for a long time. Yeah. Right. You know, like we all probably use um, you know um, screen capture software uh, that has better editing tools than Final Cut Pro ever did. Mm -hmm. And so at some point they just had to say, you know what, we got to cut our losses and not do like maybe a company like maybe Adobe does, just keep on piling crap or Microsoft. Let's just make and we're going to come up with a new version of Word that has you know tables and you know this and that and graphs and. It's like it gets so bloated that it's at some point you got to say, you know what, we got to start from scratch. The heck, we know we're going to suffer, we're going to lose some people. But we got to begin, we got to innovate from scratch or it's never going to be great. It's just going to be sort of fumbling along. So, so now that we're on software, um, uh, I'll derail this conversation and take it in a different direction. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you guys have all gotten that little infinity sign up on your computer somewhere. Infinity. Um, Create your cloud. toolbar. Oh, uh, yes. yeah. Creative yeah, Cloud is now melting the internet. Well, except for me, it's on the taskbar at the bottom. But you know, whatever. Well, whatever you have, <laughs> wherever your taskbar is, <laughs> on my on my on my work computer, it's on the top. On my other work computer, it's on the bottom. So, um, Creative Cloud is now shipping. Meaning, if uh, you've converted, you can now download <laughs> all the all. <laughs> yes, yes. And by shipping, we mean jamming your internet connection. Um, so now you can upgrade. So I, I actually have a question for you Creative Cloud people, meaning James. Um, <laughs> uh, when I currently have, uh, and, and uh, Doug, Doug, who is not yeah, allowed Doug. to talk about it, uh, when I have things like Photoshop CS6 installed already, and this is a question that everyone's asking right now. That's why I'm asking. I have Photoshop CS6 installed. And then on that bar, I now get the option of updating Photoshop CS6 or installing Photoshop CC. Right? Yeah. So right now, they're shipping the two different things. And what do I do? What should people well, do? Actually, should they that's actually caused me a little bit of, of a problem, to be honest with you, because the CS6 release has uh, a couple of different flavors. There was the release for most products, for the release that came out of the box. And then when they went to Creative Cloud, they initially did what I'd, I like to call a CS6.5 release, dot .5 release. Um, I actually got a tech support question the other day about a Dreamweaver CS6 course that I wrote that we did screen cap on with it out of the box. But then they actually put some new features in on the cloud. So if you, if you got it out of the box, it looks one way, and it functions one way. If you got CS6 and updated it from the cloud, then it functions a different way. So there's actually two different versions of CS6 out there. So it's almost like asking you for CS6, do you want to update to the most recent version, which will be the last version of CS6? Uh -huh. um, and then do you want to install CC, which is the new version? So you, you kind of have to look at it that way. So you, you, can't, you can't have both of them installed concurrently. Well, that's what that's I was going to say. I haven't tried. So if I click on update, it'll update my CS6. But if I click on CC, it'll scrap the old one and then... No, no. no. You, can have CS, you can have CC and CS6 concurrently. You can't have the updated version of CS6 and the out-of-the-box CS6 concurrently. Oh, that's what you mean. Yeah. So, I, for example, I just started teaching Illustrator at San Francisco State. All the computers there in the computer labs have CS6. So mm -hmm. I have CS6 installed. That's the only CS6 app I still have installed from my old version of Creative Cloud. But I now have CC uh, installed alongside. So now that now that it's out, what do we think? 
I have I yet to it. open it. I just installed it. So. Uh, <laughs> the, the working updating, on all this stuff. I, I was impressive. It. Yeah, I really like it. I think the update <clears throat> feature they they did a nice job of that. Um, and that was something that would actually be it was actually really difficult and would be very easy to screw up. Um, the uh, the sync to me uh, is a feature that they haven't fully you know they're it's not mature it's not it's, it's not, not quite there ready. they disabled it is that is that what you <clears throat> yeah. is that the Behance thing no that's no not, the Behance is like a so gallery right yeah it's so like, it's, it's, like drop, example, it's like Dropbox but you know but it doesn't work. No, they, they they disabled it, and so then it's not like other, Dropbox. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's very not like Dropbox. Yeah, and then the other thing that, that they didn't work. launch, which I was pissed off about, was that the, the whole TypeKit integration stuff they disabled as well. Yes, so they did. So basically, all it is is the original <laughs> like Creative Cloud, like here's this quick way to get all your here's a quick way to get all your apps, plus like a kind of lame integration with Behance. I mean, all the things that they showed off at Max that were like really, I was actually kind of like, wow, that's pretty cool. They didn't ship. Which but do you I'm think like, that that's just coming down the pipe, or is there some other reason for it? They've been saying that they're going to do file sync on and off for the last, you know, almost two years now. Well, I don't really and, care about the file sync. That's just silly. But the type kit no, is what no, actually I, that's, matters. That's, that's right? fine, it's not like, silly, though, Morton. It's not. No, no, no I, I understand though, that. But, my point, though, is that if Adobe's going to say they're going to ship something, then. No. Freaking ship it, you know. It's 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 you know it's trying to keep you know people on board and like and the whole font thing. I mean, you know, the whole integration with like desktop fonts for DPS and for print publishing and, and web fonts and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that was like wow. I would get Creative Cloud for that. Yeah. And then they didn't announce that it wasn't going to ship until right. they actually made the software available. So right. I'm like, that's kind of a bait and switch, in my opinion. Yeah, I think what I, I think meant, right, James, is that the the sync thing isn't a concern to me because obviously there's a technical problem, and once they've <laughs> sorted that out, they won't ship it. But the font thing is more of a concern, specifically because of what uh, uh, Doug said. Because the font thing is a lot of people have been holding back on getting Typekit because you're basically buying individual fonts, and it's really like. Bleh. But then now they're going to ship it, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, that's the first day I'm going to check out when I install it. You install it, and it's not there." And then it's like, but that was kind of the selling point, wasn't it? Yeah, and I mean, it'll they'll they'll work out the bugs, they'll work out the kinks. Uh, the Typekit blog had an update um, just yesterday as to when the desktop fonts are going to be available, which you know should be in a couple of weeks. Um, so you know, it, it should be all right. But I'm I'm with Doug on the fact that if you're going to make a big announcement about it, you know, you could have just said coming soon. You, you know, yeah. um, if you're going to make a big announcement about it, make sure that it's ready to go when you flip the switch. Sync obviously wasn't. They had it up for a little while. Uh, it broke, and everybody got really mad about it, so now apparently they've turned it off. Um, the update feature is really nice, and it works really well. Um, you, it actually surprises me how quickly it does download and, and install some of the software. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good updater. So at least they got that right. So when we originally talked about this, I brought up an issue that I think became far more evident to me now that I installed it, and that is uh, CC assumes that you have a really strong internet connection with a lot of bandwidth um, because you know you have to download all this stuff and there are updates piping in all the time. And if you live in the United States in uh, San Francisco or somewhere else where there's like unlimited bandwidth at all times and you have a T1 pipe into your house, then you're fine. If you live in Canada, where you have data caps that are quite stringent, it's not cool. If you live in, like, I don't know, Romania or Africa or Inner Mongolia or somewhere where there is no broadband internet, you are so screwed with this because... Well, that's because Adobe killed... made a business decision, and that was their decision. I mean, you know... Yeah, but... I understand that part. What I'm saying is people who get this have to be aware. Like, if I'm in Canada, the reason why I'm downloading it all now is because I'm at the Linda headquarters. I'm using their bandwidth to download it. Because if I install this on several computers at home, it'll blow out my bandwidth. And I actually have a really expensive plan already. It's just that if I, like, they cap how much, how many terabytes I can download per month. And this thing alone, with all the updates that are being pushed out, will actually kill my data connection. So just, you can't just complain wait, about just it. Just wait for the Google balloon internet, okay? Yes. There you go. Yes. Balloon. Project They'll, like, balloon. drift them into Canada, and then the Canadian border services will shoot them yeah, down so, because they're so much um, drugs. So, uh, you know, I expect to hear less complaining about the U.S. from you now that you have to come here to use the bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> you know, 
Wait, hang on a second. I want, I want to go back to what Doug was talking about with the Google Internet balloon. Yeah. That's the freakiest Fra- thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I swear to God. You know, the people at Google were sitting around getting stoned one day, and one guy went, wait, dude, I got an idea. <laughs> balloon. <laughs> I think they did this well, in Norway. Way. There, and it'll be like a big wireless router yeah. for the world. I think they did that in Norway so several years ago. Cheetos. Because if you, if you think about it, there are many places in the world where you have, like, valleys, right? Where you have, like, a 800-meter-high mountain on both sides. So it's impossible to get a signal in. So there are several places, like, in Norway and Sweden and other places where there are a lot of mountains where they put these uh, repeaters everywhere on top of every mountain because it's the only way of reaching things. But I distinctly remember someone talking about doing, like, uh, I think it was a cell phone balloon in Norway. Oh, right, right, right. Um, yeah. Because that was the only way they could uh, get a signal in. And I actually remember I was on, um, I was in Spitsbergen, which is uh, as far north as you can get if you don't want to go to the North Pole. Um, and we walked around a mountain. And it's crazy because you're in Spitsbergen. It's technically in Norway. So you still have cell phone coverage. But then you walk around a mountain and then all of a sudden you are absolutely cut off from the world. There's no way of getting in touch with anyone. There's no signal anywhere. And the only way you can get out is through um, a satellite phone, right? And that was the first time in a long time I'd been, like, truly out of reach. And I realized people live in places like this where there is no connection to anything. So although it sounds insane, I think it's an interesting idea. I'm more concerned about... All I know is with the recent announcement of Google's uh, complicity with the NSA and the CIA, I'm not really sure the idea of having them floating balloons above my head and beaming stuff at me is a good idea. Well, that's what I was going to say. We'll find out they got all the balloons for free from the NSA, you know. That's how many, right. <laughs> how many cameras have they attached on the bottom, and how high is that resolution? I'm going to start wearing a tinfoil hat so the Google balloons don't tell me what to do. <laughs> this is a really cool animation. Yeah. yeah, it is. I can't believe they called it Loon. Yeah, that's also, like, I, when I heard this, I'm like, what, is it, like, April 1st again? I'm what? telling you, man, they were sitting around getting baked one <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> So is that the it's probably, it's probably this an, it's probably this animation cost one billion dollars to make as well. <laughs> yeah, so. your tax dollars at work. <laughs> Pretty close. So um, since since you decided to touch on that, um, I, I have to say this because it's bothering the hell out of me. So for all you Americans who are watching this and you Here are so with America, no, 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 no. This is, this is this is truly like. For all you Americans who are watching this and you're really concerned about PRISM and the government uh, surveillance program, that government surveillance program is actually targeted towards everyone that's not American. So all of us people who are not Americans, we should be way more concerned because it's actually spelled out that it's and if surveillance you of that, all... I have people. a bridge to sell you in New York. <laughs> no, but of course they're going to do surveillance on Americans. But the thing is, you guys can actually vote people out of office. I can't vote for the American government. So when they are doing surveillance on people outside of the United States, they're actually breaking international laws. And that's what's going to happen now in the next two months when they have to answer all the questions that came from Angela Merkel and came from all these other people saying, right. where are, where's the deal you have with us that says you can't do surveillance on our citizens? Oh, yeah. The, so the, the only is, problem is that I can only vote... I can only vote what two people out of office. I can't vote everyone out of office. <laughs> yeah, the other problem with that, Morton, and I don't want to turn this into a political show, is that based on the last couple of elections, it doesn't really seem to matter who we vote into office. Yeah, well, you right. can just vote for yeah. someone other than the people with money. Well, no, no. But well, no, can, can, we, can we do like what you, I mean, in Kennedy, you can't just basically disband the government and then just like basically redo the whole thing, right? Uh, that would be so awesome. Like get like a do-over. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but my point with this Control is that w- what's going to happen, like, it's not getting a lot of coverage here in North America, but if you read international newspapers, you'll see that this uh, prism thing is actually causing some major problems with international relations because there's been this unspoken rule that America sits on all the major servers for the internet, and that's okay as long as they don't snoop on traffic coming from outside the United States. Now, and they've been saying all along that they don't do uh-huh. it, and of course that's been ludicrous, but now it turns out they are, which means a lot of, like, the, this is a direct violation of, like, every decree ever on information gathering, right, for international uh, purposes. So, at some point, someone is going to say, hey, those servers, they need to move. They can't be in the States anymore. Well, they've already done that. They, there was a movement about two years ago to get that to happen. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting stuff happening down the road. 
But who would you trust? Uh, I think we should put them in balloons and (laughs) and put them. I'm not sure. You know, we could be like Glenn Beck and just like you know make our own like America Town and then just there you go. Everyone there. So let's do that. Let's make Americaville. (laughs) There we go. go. Isn't that a show? The only Morton's thing it would serve is steak and French fries. That's just it. So, Morton, All you so can Morton's eat happier. We should call it Can America or something. Can Can they Can they or something? I'm Norwegian. Oh, yeah, but you're <laughs> yeah, really happy Swedish. with it. Hey guys, by the way, we're talking about um, Creative Cloud, it's actually doing super well. I was reading this article earlier, and uh, they had they are ahead of pr- predictions on what they were supposed to do on Creative Cloud. Mm-hmm. You know, hitting seven hundred thousand subscriptions already, and those numbers are ahead of what they thought, where they thought they were going to be. So I'm sort of surprised about that. I didn't think they would actually do better than what they thought, unless maybe they set really low expectations. So I guess that means that Sean New gets to keep his job. That's, that's... <laughs> yeah, which uh, was surprising to hear about Microsoft that they backed out on some of the Xbox One plans. Well, it's a good thing yeah. they did that because those were stupid. Well, again, that's consumer backlash, and yeah. at least, at least in that instance, you know, the company was smart enough to listen to what people were saying, right. because that thing was going to be a huge failure if they had shipped I mean, it. Right I, I, mean, I mean, you all know that I'm a Microsoft guy, and I right. actually didn't even like all that stuff as well. I mean, the, but at this, you know, it, there are certain. Like, for me, it was mostly about the, the being able to share games and things like yeah. that. Right. The always on connection. It didn't bother me that much, but again, I'm in an area that's you know basically I'm connected all the time anyway. So for gaming though, Doug, right. that bothers me because I'm a different kind of gamer. I'm not a social gamer. I yeah. don't get online and play other people, and I don't do any of that stuff. I just you know hook up the Xbox every now and then at night, shoot some bad guys, and go to bed, and that's all I want out of it. You know, the so. only the only reason why I have a gold subscription is because I used to use my Xbox to watch Netflix. And I got a subscription at a discount from Microsoft. Like I've never played an online game on my Xbox ever, and I've had one for like six or seven years. Yeah, in the same so, way. One of the things I was actually disappointed is that at the same time that they announced that they were removing all the DRM, they took away a lot of features. So I, I wasn't really pleased about that. So with the new Xbox One, what was supposed to happen is if you bought a game, you could share it with like nine other machines. Mm-hmm. Now It's meant they, to be like a family share kind of thing. Exactly. Now that yeah. they've taken that out, so they're saying, well, we're going to let you guys share, but we're taking out the ability to share, you know, sorry, we're going to let you resell your games and, um, you know, give somebody your discs, but we're taking away the ability to share your games with other people, which I thought was really petty. Well, well that's how it is now, I mean, I, though, I, I, so that's not... I, really, actually, uh, I actually don't think it was petty. I think it was like, all right, well, you reacted to this, so we will allow you to do this, but in order for us to build that same capability that we wanted to do initially, we're gonna to have to re-engineer and how implement that in a different way. So I would I would guess that they're probably gonna come out later in the year with a with an update on how they can do that after. Yeah, I hope so. Because I, I was really looking forward to that because I have two Xboxes, and uh, you know I have to right now buy like two separate games, and and I that was really good, but I really hated the whole DRM thing. Like, what that's, do you mean you have to buy two separate games? If yeah. you're playing it on both, you have to yeah, have, you have, to have the time, disc have to have... inside the machine to play the game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and even yeah. even if you buy it online, like even if you go buy it in the online store, yeah. you have to buy two separate copies in order to play some games, like say Minecraft or, or Halo. You know, there's like other technology that works like that, like books and things, CDs, whatever. You're technically, if you buy a CD, you're technically not allowed to copy it onto another device. Hmm? No, technically I don't. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> nope. So, uh, yeah. I create backups. <laughs> yes, I need backups on all my devices of my music. All right. So I know we're not doing the one big thing today, but I have a couple of things to share with you guys yeah, before we get done. So, um, lost in all the stuff that's been going on lately uh, is uh, the announcement that Adobe released Top Coat. Uh, anybody uh, ever heard of Top Coat? Yes, yes it's have. a UI framework for edge code and stuff. Yeah, I wonder where I put it. Um, I got oh. it. I got you, man. I got your back. You got me good, because, yeah, for some <laughs> reason I closed that tab. Uh, anyway, uh, so TopCoat is their, their CSS uh, framework, um, that, and it's actually the framework that they've used to develop some of their tools, like uh, like brackets or edge code 
which is what they're calling it now. Um, it's a really nice CSS framework. Um, it's really, really well documented, um, extremely fast. Uh, they've, they've built it around performance, and uh, they actually have benchmark tests that you can go check out. Uh, so if you're the type of person that likes to use frameworks, um, uh, this is definitely one to take a look at. Uh, the other thing that I really like about it is they've got this theme builder thing that allows you to go in and build themes so you can customize it, and it's uh, it's really, really well done. So big fan of Top Coat. You know, I like, saw cool. the website, and you can't like really click on any of these things. What's going on with that? Like, yes, it's built with Top Coat. The themeable. Okay, I'm clicking. <laughs> you have to go over to get... You have to go over to GitHub for all the goodness, dude. That's just yeah. That's the... what I'm saying. Like, uh, does, aren't things supposed to be clickable? Like, what's going? I I don't trust oh, any Jesus. framework that doesn't. <laughs> the links are clickable. See those blue things? Yeah, but dude, you design websites for a living. Usability. <laughs> the, haven't you heard about usability? It's like this thing where, like, if you have a picture and it's right next to like something, you're supposed to click on it. Come on, that's okay. the first thing people click. All right. But anyways, book right, you're in form. you're in quite the form today. <laughs> I'm just picking on you, sir. I don't All care. right, so uh, results and what? Okay, cool. It looks. It looks actually. I saw. It, I took a look at it. It looked really interesting, you know. Um, and I, I think Adobe could do some really awesome things with integration and top code. So what are you guys laughing about? I man? especially like this graphic. Right, right. You're funny today. You're like, you, 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 <laughs> your, your, your mode today is initially trash and then defend. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, this is terrible, but I like it. It's cool. Well, it's I mean, it just bothers me. Like, I, I have, I have a pet peeve about photo next to data that is not clickable, and then you got to click on the link. I'm sorry. Dude, you're well, thanks for focusing like on the important things. <laughs> like, you can't click on anything. <laughs> you are Jeez. starting to sound like me. That's not where's good. The, where's the docs? Like, I don't see do, do, download version. You have to go to uh, here. Oh, hold on. That downloads a zip. Okay, so I got to go to Go to GitHub, dude. <laughs> where's, the, right. the, where's the GitHub link? Look at, at the, the bottom. bottom. No, it's at a GitHub icon at Everyone the bottom. Everyone saw that except we, you. Is that, is that what we're getting to? Like, you got to scroll down and get to the bottom and then click on GitHub for docs. And <laughs> I then, think you should uh, file a bug report on this thing. No. Wow. Let's see wow. What Ray, you sound like my mother. I That's what I was thinking. It's like a 70 earlier. No, all the way to the bottom. What do you mean? What, what is this is internet? This? What do I, I love don't understand? Okay. Listen, Why would they just tell me what to do? <laughs> I'm going to this website. Look, so to, far. Okay, that's nice. I need Where to is Yahoo the, docs? the Google. Like, you know, wow. It doesn't say docs anywhere. Anyways, well, I'm sorry. This deteriorated like quickly. So I don't like the, the website. I'm sorry. <laughs> what's the other thing you got, James? <laughs> let's let's see sure? what I can do to the next thing you, you bring up. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet oh, for this God. next thing. <laughs> okay, so what used to be the regions and shapes um, specification that Adobe was putting out there has now been split into two modules. And um, the shapes module uh, draft just came out. So uh, right now it's not even really a working draft. There's the first release of it, which is the editor's draft, which is uh, what I have up on the screen right now. Um, so shapes and regions, again, they were combined into one uh, specification, but now they've been split so that they can evolve at a different pace. And uh, Shapes was maybe a little bit um, ahead of regions in terms of implementations within the browser. So now this allows browser uh, manufacturers to go in and work on these uh, at different paces, which is actually a plus for everybody. For those of you that haven't kept up with what these are, regions allows you to flow content from one containing block into another one. So if you think of them like text boxes, that's really a, a good way to, to maybe think of it. And shapes allows you to basically create shapes um, other than boxes to not only put text in, but also exclude text from. So it's a very handy way to do pull quotes and to do magazine style layouts. So both of those, this is the shapes module level one and the regions module level one actually is at the uh, old link um, although there's an editor's draft out, which is what I have up on screen right now, and I've got the link for that for you, Morton, uh, here as well. So you can sort of read up as to what they're doing in terms of splitting these guys out. But it's something you want to stay up on because browser manufacturers are beginning to implement these uh, within their browsers. So we should see some support for these coming out very, very soon. So, uh, James, have you seen that um, thing that Adobe did for National Geographic? The website yeah, that that's, demos, yes, that, that uses both uh, regions and shapes. That yeah, uses so both of those. I'll I'll share that. Uh, yeah, it's really nice. It's, it's a it's a it's a really cool layout, and it 
you know, I don't know how many people are going to want to emulate magazine style layouts on on the internet. You know, it's really two different mediums. Um, so I really think instead of seeing a lot of, I think we'll see some people initially do that because a lot of visual designers out there will say like, oh, I can work in the form factors that I'm used to working in. Um, you know, a lot of print designers that do web design will probably do that. But I think what we'll see more than anything else is a hybridization of these different layout types. Uh, you will see people start to uh, put little things in there that um, they haven't been able to do before because we're so used to seeing text in boxes uh, online. That's all we've been able to have really since the start of it. So I, I'm really interested to see kind of where this goes. Uh, it's, it's gonna. It's, it's, really it's gonna. Neat. James, it's gonna be shapes, regions, <laughs> parallax, in muse. There you go. Oh my God, that'll be the best thing ever. <laughs> with the pastel, pastel gradients, with Past, yeah, pastel with gradients with semi open corners with, that are with, far too high. Uh, yeah, with, far with, too with, big. Yeah, uh, you know, semi opaque is. overlays with like icons. Yes, <laughs> I can dream, Doug. I can dream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I actually have something too. Um, there was an article that I think was posted today. Uh, no, yesterday, because you know it's the same to me. Um, uh, by uh, uh, the guys over at uh, Happy Cog. Yeah, they occasionally do good work over there. Um, Every now and then. So the article is about this. Uh, well, it takes it takes it starts off talking about this infernal poster that everyone hates so much, and by everyone yeah. I mean me. The one that says "Keep calm and carry on" that you've seen. Yes. If you ever, if you ever want to know the backstory to this, you should actually read it because it's very cool. And it's it is. It's actually, it was actually a World War II thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. the way it's being used now is, I don't know. And it, it, and it wasn't widespread. They found it in an old subway tunnel. Um, yeah, but it was uh, published. How many? Uh, they uh, printed over twenty, no, two point five million copies and printed them, placed, placed them all over London uh, right before the war. Um, right. And anyway, it's completely irrelevant to the story. Um, this article talks about uh, using a keep calm and carry on approach in uh, developing software, uh, working with clients, and just generally working. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a type of approach that I remember my dad taught me when I was a kid that you know there's never a problem that's not big enough that you can't fix it. But the most important thing is that you have to <laughs> take a step back, calm down kind of think through the problem, not just immediately go, oh my, you know, it's falling apart. What wait, wait, hold on a second. This is a workflow process? <laughs> it sounds like common sense to yes. me. I, I don't know. I, I think... You've, you've, you've worked in a creative environment. You know what happens is when something goes horribly wrong, everyone's <laughs> like, he did it! It is like, you know, it's not a solution. Like That's not often, just creative environments. That's every environment. Yeah. And that's what they're talking about, how instead of instead of immediately going to worst case scenario, try to take a more calm approach to it. And he's taking it based on the poster and the idea there. Well, like, hang on a second. I, we have a life coach with us here yes. today. So <laughs> I, I want to hear Doug Winnie's. His, he, he is a life development um, guru now. Mm -hmm. What does Lacrosse pay? tell us about this, Doug? Tell us, Guru. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd use more forceful language, but this is a mixed, mixed uh, audience. So. <laughs> Shut up. My dad would say, stop crying. I'll give you something to cry about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it is common sense. I, 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 when I was managing designers and developers, same thing happened. The client would come back and say, like, oh, 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 and then they'd say, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm like, really? I hired you because you're smart. So be, <laughs> so be freaking smart and get out of my office, okay? So it's, But to then tie it into a poster, that just seems kind of lame. But. No, but yeah, it seems like they were really needing an article, and they didn't have a whole lot of time. And they were like, come up with something, dude. Uh, okay, okay, uh, keep calm and carry on. Oh, you cynics. Oh, you cynics. I am cynical about it because, I mean, I think it's, yes, it's, it's, it's common, reaching. I, I mean, it's common sense and it's reaching, but the point is... The point is, people, is that not everyone has common sense. Yes, more and more people who work in our industry are not trained in common sense and, like, clear thinking and being are able to... Are you talking about, like, the way Ray was freaking out about links? Yes. Images you should just click links. on the image. Im <laughs> the Come on, guys. Clickable. Images should be clickable to links. I'm sorry. It's, it's uh, <laughs> common sense to me. 
I don't know what's uncommon about that. Anyways, yeah. I, so right, right, like, but but just I don't but very, very, very appropriate, <laughs> very appropriately, you know, uh, the one the one person here that is, you know, it is British, you know, is being calm <laughs> so and caring. I know. And is not British, participating, and it's just <laughs> watching us, watching us stupid North American. Norwegian people just kind of like battle it out while you sit back and watch. I think well, Simon is actually watching it. getting video. ever so cross over nothing. It's just a storm in a teacup. Let's all go back to work. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> With, you know, Simon, you are awfully calm. You just had a guy call you British and, and you remain I am, calm about it. I am British. I am British and I am a Scot as well. We, we I, didn't say, I didn't say English. I said British. Exactly. That's true. That's true. You didn't say English. That's true. So where do you stand on the Scottish uh, separation? Uh, what? Oh, God. what is this show now? <laughs> oh, my God. What are you no, doing? Like the separation. <laughs> um, I, I don't really. I mean, again, after having not lived there for 15 years, it wouldn't quite be right for me to have a big emotional um, decision about that. Um, but having said that, you know, part of my, I have a different background because I grew up in England as well. So, you know, family and, and history is, is all through the UK. So I'm... You know, personally, not a huge believer in the separation, but I have no big investment in it either. <laughs> so that's, that's a bit non-committal. Well, it is non-committal. I am non-committal about the whole thing. I am not someone who um, gets too perturbed. I will just keep calm and carry on whatever happens. I think we just <laughs> lost our last five listeners. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the last five people that can uh, continue to tune into this thing. Just oh, do you want me to have to be a bit, oh, it's uh, terrible. We want separation, independence. We will have our freedom. <laughs> no, no. It's Get just, some blue face paint, Simon. I want to uh, see you in some blue face paint. Absolutely. Well, now, we're, we're, we're talking about arrested development, though, because, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're throwing everything in here, so yeah. Yeah. Do it. Let's throw lacrosse in there, too. Oh, <laughs> but but uh, to, to be serious, I honestly believe that you know I, I guess the poster threw you guys off, but I honestly believe the message in this article is actually a valid one that um, you need to kind of be reflective of what you do because uh, what I'm seeing a lot of because I guess because I've worked with a lot of people who kind of train themselves to be in this industry, they're not coming at it from a very um, uh, balanced approach and I remember I talked to my mom because she was taking a painting class once and uh, they were doing oil painting so you know you just keep painting over the same stuff and the oil never dries and you can keep messing with it and at some point her teacher said you need to stop like you can't just continue painting this thing forever right and you see that a lot in um, uh, this kind of industry because if you're working especially as a freelancer or something like that see he got so annoyed. I love, him. I love it when James gets <laughs> talked about. James just said, I'm done. He's like, I'm not we heard like a toilet flushing in a minute. I'm going to laugh. <laughs> but, like, but when, you're, um, when you're working on something, especially something design related, it's, it's very easy to become obsessed about it. And then not like uh, if you run into a problem, you get so caught that you just can't get past. And what they're trying to say is when that happens, take a step back. You know, realize that this is not going to end your career in design. It's just that you have you ran into an issue and try to deal with the issue in a rational manner. And I think that's valuable. I, I think, I think part of it is also a generational problem because because I think that you know generally when I when I hear people that are going into design and development today, they haven't had a lot of constructive criticism in their in their life, and you know they haven't had someone go to them and say, "Wow, yeah, you're you you know the design you know." Your topography is bad, and you know their spacing is bad, and you know your your design pattern usage is really poor, and you know instead it's like, wow, great, yeah, you finished the project, that's great, you know, here's a gold star. Are you trying to say something about millennials? Have you seen that video? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little well, bit. But well, it's... here's the thing: if you, I'm almost glad that this poster, this this concept, is so widely known that it has lost a lot of its emotional impact. Because if yeah. it hadn't, if it wasn't so widespread then you probably would have a lot of very annoyed Brits going, you know, let's get some perspective here. You're using this for a creative thing. This poster was meant to, you know, work with the morale of cities that was being carpet bombed. There's quite a difference between that and somebody didn't like the color on my icon. It's like, yeah, you didn't have a, a V1 flying bomb land in your backyard, which, personal history, my family actually did. My mother's house had to happen. Wow. It didn't go off, but they had a, a doodle bug. 
um, hit their backyard and uh. blow all the windows out. And if it had gone off, I wouldn't be here now. Um, but, but yeah, so you know, there's kind of a different thing. That's what that originally was for. So I'm kind of glad it's become a bit oversaturated well, that uh, now really doesn't matter that much. See, this is the first time I've ever seen someone uh, discuss a reason, like talk about a reason to use that graphic that wasn't inane and stupid. Because I keep seeing it being used and like keep like carry on and eat bacon, you know, keep calm and uh, stand outside, keep calm and wear orange. There like, you go, Ray. Make like, your own, buddy. It's just, uh, you know, keep I, calm I was and just like, images. I, I, I can't, I, I don't <laughs> like the idea, but I saw like this explanation. I'm like, okay, I can, I can actually stand by this. I could see someone using this as an actual positive thing rather than making fun of it like people are. Yes. All right. Right. Ray, so how much does this cost? Can I buy it? Keep Calm-O-Matic. I'm going to make a (laughs) t-shirt with this. It's responsive. And link images. It is responsive. Unlike Ray. (laughs) Ouch. Do the images link? I don't know. Yeah, apparently not. (laughs) This one does. Yes, sir. Check it out. Sweet. No, that's not good. Anyway, sorry. Sorry. Uh, that's, that's very nice, Ray. Now you've offended every British one of your... <laughs> Shame you on you. won't stand for this kind of nonsense. What does it say? <laughs> Dear Dad... What does it say? Get off the podcast. Stop, <laughs> stop, stop this in your friends or something. <laughs> Aww. That's so cute. She doesn't care that Daddy's on a show. <laughs> <laughs> neither, uh, neither does my cat. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've come full circle. Uh, anyone going to bid on the uh, chain mail for the guinea pig? What? What? <laughs> you guys haven't seen this? No. That's totally okay, random. Gonna, I will end with this then. Uh, oh, great. Chain mail for a guinea pig. Yeah, this is like major. You talking about a guinea pig chain letter? Chain, chain mail, like like armor for a guinea pig. Armor. (laughs) Hold on, I'm I'm trying to find it. Just uh, is it this thing? Hold on, I got something here. It is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm not googling that. Yes, that's what it is, on eBay. I gotta admit, that's pretty damn cool. That's it's like awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this is what the world has come to. The internet has produced this. That's all I want to say. You know. Thank you, internet. Thank, <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah, yay! Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find another one because there's the one that a friend of mine had. It was. Uh, a micro pig in a raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's also one that has ducks that have raincoats and hats. Mm. See, it's, you know, we can talk about all these great things about the internet, but it does produce chain mails for... Which is really kind of cute. Oh, not, a bad, not a bad thing. Although if you had a thousand of them outside of your door one morning, you'd probably be a little <laughs> intimidated. <laughs> Hand over the cheese. <laughs> but, the, but, you know, uh, jokes aside, uh, the guy who's selling it is actually giving away all the money, all the proceeds of selling it to uh, a guinea pig rescue charity. So, What? Yes. <laughs> because, you know, there are a lot of people who, like, as a former guinea pig owner, I can tell you, there's a lot of people who buy guinea pigs and they realize they, they're huge and they make a lot of noise and then they want to get rid of them. Yeah. Right? And then they leave them in the forest and stuff, but those animals can't live in the forest. They're domesticated. So, you know, if you leave them in the forest, they'll literally walk up to the side of the road and sit there and wait for people to come pick them up, which is terrible. So, he's giving the, the proceeds from selling the armor. <laughs> James is well, like, what, what oh, he should do, no, 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 what he should do is give the armor to the pigs that are in the, the guinea pigs that are in the, uh, the forest so that when they go up to the road, they, they can fight. <laughs> That That's would a great be awesome, idea. actually. It would just protect them through. against uh, predators, oh. and then you yep. would have a chance of seeing an armored guinea pig when you go into the woods. And, 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 they, look like, and they look like a badass. Come on. Yep. And, then, and then what they can do is mount cameras on them, and then, 
and then they can go the pro NSA game will Pikachu. Sponsor, <laughs> sponsor by the NSA. Oh, this is I the see. best show ever. This is. <laughs> this is the best show ever. This is the best right. one we've ever done. By the way, next I next week I'm going to Microsoft Build, so oh, I'll have awesome. a lot to talk about there. Oh, so that's the. I, I think we're doing this wrong. We don't. We shouldn't do a tech show. We should just talk about dogs and guinea pigs and cats and yeah. and Norwegian politics. <laughs> so, but, but jokes aside, so that is exactly the same thing as WWDC. Just in fact, they already have ripped down all the WWDC banners and put up the Microsoft ones. So. Oh, because in the same place. It's in the same place. <laughs> That's Microsoft. hilarious. Simon, well, I bet you are so glad you showed up for today. It's been a pleasure. Strange. <laughs> a he is pleasure. so late. Holy cow. <laughs> Indeed, I'm just keeping calm and carrying on. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, so next week, I guess we'll talk about uh, more Microsoft uh, NDA material. Wait, are you going to be here, though? When is the conference? I'll, 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 be, I'll be able to make it, yeah. But when's the conference? Is it the middle of the week? Uh, it's Wednesday through Friday. OK. So you'll join us on Friday and break your NDA, right? No, there, there is no NDA. I mean, I'll, I'll show all the stuff that they announce, and you know, if there are any toys, I'll show them off too. Awesome. Yay. Cool. All right. That is full time for uh, <coughs> content. Uh, thank you all for joining in. Doug, James, Ray, and Simon. And Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I hope we see you next week. Peace out. Cheers.